everybody see my screen? Yes, Nicole. Yes. Okay, right. Um, so this is my first webinar, so please be kind. Um, but yes, um, as in the introduction um, was mentioned, that it's important that it builds confidence to do these types of things. It's very good for your um, career. And, you know, people get to see you out there and each bit manager is different. So please, while we're going through this, um, I'd like you to put in the chat, I can read them afterwards, unfortunately I can't see the chat, but um, I can read all the comments afterwards about how you do your bid planning and your bid writing. Um, you know, it's important that people learn from one another, um, especially, you know, I'm in South Africa, we have people from all over the world, um, so each one is different and it's just nice to get uh, an idea and to learn from one another. Um, I don't know about in other countries, but I think in South Africa, the bid proposal um, community is shrinking. So I think we need to stand together and um, yeah, and learn from one another. So the agenda for today, um, I'm going to take you through why, why should we plan? When do we plan? What do we plan? How do we plan? And then a few tips on bid writing and then just putting it all together in a summary. So um, first, let's look at the definition of a plan. And um, I went through on various websites um, looking for definitions of a plan. And there's quite a few um, various definitions. Some uh, are not too great. Um, as an example, Wikipedia says planning is the process of thinking regarding the activities. But if you only think about the activities, um, nobody can read your mind. So where would you actually, you know, put this plan? How would you get it into action? And um, definitions.net says the act or process of drawing up plans or layouts for some projects. Um, do we need to plan some of our bids? Um, for me, I think bid planning should be on every bid that you do, no matter the size, but um, we'll get to that. Um, Merriam Webster says planning is the act or process of making or carrying out plans. Um, you can carry out your plan, but you first need to document your plan. Um, otherwise, people are not really going to know what to do. And then my best definition that I got um, for planning is business, from business jargons. And it says planning is the fundamental management function. I mean, we're all a bit managers, which involves deciding beforehand what is to be done, when it is to be done, how it is to be done, and who is going to do what. And that to me is the basis of any plan. You need to have strict um, guidelines and set your quality controls early. So let's look at why we plan. So, I mean, every bid, as I said, um, is different, but every bid needs to have a plan. Why? So it helps us to review and validate the quality of our proposals. I mean, if we just put any old junk in there that we feel is relevant, um, it leads to disqualification. So it makes sure that you have qualified everything that the customer is asking for and that you follow their instructions um, to the T. So what does a plan also do? It provides a high level view of what our proposal will be look, what, what our proposal will look like at the end. So this also, it improves our quality, as I've said, it reduces waste. So remember, waste is not only money, uh, time is money. So if you're wasting your time, you're wasting money. Um, I'm not sure how um, you do your proposals elsewhere in the country, but for us in South Africa, um, when we do a physical submission, so it's printing, uh, we bind it in a file, we use ink to either write some of our um, tenders say it has to be handwritten. So it's time again, um, it's the ink that you use to write, it's the ink that you use to print, the paper you print on, etc. And then we wrap it all up in brown paper. And yes, so if we don't plan and we get disqualified, you've wasted all of those um, stationary and materials. 
And then it also produces faster proposal production. So we all know that bid managers never have enough time, um, especially at the end when everybody gives you everything together. So um, when we plan, um, we can produce our um, proposals at a quicker uh, time. The plan can also help you to decide what proposal success means to you. Um, does proposal success mean, oh, I've delivered a proposal to a customer? Uh, does it mean that I've delivered it on time? Uh, does it mean that I have delivered a well-written, well-organized um, proposal to the customer? So you need to think about what will make your bid stand out and why the customer should choose your bid and make your bid the bid of choice instead of a choice. I mean, customers, um, I've been to um, briefing sessions where there's like in excess of 30 or 40 customers that are responding to the same bid. So a customer gets, uh, puts out a proposal, he gets, I don't know, in excess of 10, 20, 30 responses. Then he gets all those responses back and everybody that has responded has more or less got the same story to tell. So if we don't plan our proposals and decide what is going to make our proposal stand out, by the time uh, you could be number 20 in line that the um, adjudicator or the customer has read, by the time they've read that, they have forgotten what, has, what you've said in your proposal. So definitely, um, the thing for me that stands out here is to make your proposal the proposal of choice instead of a choice. So when do we plan? Um, so the little cartoon at the bottom, um, I'm presuming they're building a house, but I mean, they built the roof, but there's no building. So the guy's saying, maybe we should have built the roof last. So if you don't plan, um, how would you know what is gonna come first? What's gonna come second? So um, it's always done before you write. So winning content is planned before it is created. Anything, um, what you do is planned before you actually do it. Without that, you're definitely going to fail. So it's essential to map your proposal to the issues of the customers, what the customer is asking for, the various activities that need to take place, if you have project plans and things like that, um, that need to go into your proposal. And um, this can assist you to reach your submission deadline well in advance. I know, um, you know, we always plan to have our bids done two or three days before. Um, yes, that's seeing is believing, but when I plan properly, and um, I'll get to the section of buy-in here, when people buy in um, and they have um, you know, you've set up your um, kickoff meeting and you show them your bid plan before the time and they commit to those um, dates and times and what they need to do. You find that you have more success than when you actually just um, don't get their buy-in. So yes, let's see what's next. What do we plan? So um, we can plan on a whole lot of different things. We can plan the bid requirements and the conditions. We gather um, information regarding the customer, what the opportunity is. We do competitors. This is where we can ghost our competitors better. Um, we consider what solution we're going to offer our customer and what will differentiate us from everybody. So basically um, your um, differentiators, and um, there's a space in that where you can um, add your differentiators, you can determine what your wind themes are going to be so that everybody can use this going throughout the whole bid response. We'll just determine what it will take to win, example, price to win. Um, I'm not gonna get into too much detail on price to win. It is um, a whole section on itself <laughs> while I was um, going through this. 
And then you can make sure that you cover all areas that you will be evaluated on. I mean, you don't want to be disqualified as an example if the customer says you must include five customer reference letters and you only put in two. You don't want to be um, disqualif disqualified on a technicality that you have left out. Um, you can also determine what graphics you're going to use. Um, will these graphics be um, readily available? Do you need to bring in extra resources to help with the graphics? And there's lots of other things that you can plan. So these considerations above is just too much of a risk to assume that somebody else is going to do it. And without um, proper planning and giving direction and support to the team, which is my buy-in, you are not going to get, uh, put in a, pr a proper proposal. So my standpoint from this is establish your quality controls early. Tell people what you want done early on in the process. So how do you plan? So for me, I've um, and I'll show you on the next couple of slides, I've put together a simple um, a bid plan that I use going forward in all my bids. And it's just a clear and very simple requirements driven um, document. I don't even have to call it a plan. It's just one little document that I've put together. And then obviously for more complex bids, um, you will use a, um, a more details into the plan. So the nice thing about um, the plan that I'm going to show you, it is definitely scalable to the size and the requirements of your bid. Um, so yes, as I said, the, the bid plan should be flexible and easy and simple so that everybody can understand exactly what they need to put in there. Um, so sometimes, um, as I said in the beginning, you, you have to plan each bid, but sometimes there is really not enough time to do a whole amount of planning. So um, then you would decide what is the most important aspects that you would need to plan, be it the executive summary and win themes, be it your competitor analysis and price to win. Um, so there's various things that you can think about dependent on the time that you have. I mean, I know, um, I'm sure all over every bit manager's issue, um, you get a bid today and the customer wants it in five days time. So really, um, is there enough time to plan everything? Um, not always, but do not skip the planning phase. So this is the bid plan. I'm show you on the next couple of slides. Um, just a simple and easy bid plan that I've used. Um, you'll have them on the slides um, when Pascal um, shares it with everybody. So you're more than welcome to, to use the, this um, plan for yourself. So it's a word, simple word document. On the first page, I will put um, the customer's name, the bid number, description, and um, very important important I use a version control because as you develop your plan um, obviously there's versions that will change so um, version one version two and that's I just put um, on the front page then the second um, page I would have the bid information like what is the customer's name the bid number um, but you can change these uh, as needed um, a very important thing that I have uh, or that, that salespeople sometimes skip by us is the bid clarification closing date. They think they can ask customers questions anytime they want to, and no, they can't. Um, then I've also have a block for milestones. So when the bid was released, when the clarification questions closed, when will the bid be adjudicated, when the project start date will be. Um, but there's many other things that sometimes a customer has a whole page of milestones that they have. They have uh, BAFOs, best and final offers. They have you must come and do a presentation. So I've just included everything there um, as I need to. Then um, the next page, I will have the bid team. So it's important for me to know who everybody is. Um, and some of them will not be applicable. As you can see, I've put if applicable. And then I've also put um, partners details because sometimes when you have multiple partners, you 
can't really remember what's this guy's telephone number or his email address, what's his name. So I've just made it easy um, and everybody on the team will have this. So if somebody needs to get hold of somebody very quickly for whatever reason, it's all in one place. And then I have a table of contents where it's um, linked to various sections of the, doc of the plan. So if I need to see customer references, I will just click on it and it will take me directly to the plan instead of having to scroll through a whole lot of um, pages. So then we get into the meat of the bid plan. So um, first I have what the RFQ or the tender or RFP requirements are. So I will use under the requirement number, I'll put it exactly the same numbering as what the customer has. It's just for ease of reference. Then I'll put the requirement and then the location where it is addressed. So it's very important to link what the customer is asking for to a space in your proposal. Um, it's just, you know, it helps them to evaluate your proposals much quicker. Then I have our win themes, uh, a place for our win themes. So whatever uh, wind themes gets developed and these you can add on to obviously as the solution gets developed as the uh, proposal gets developed then i have the evaluation criteria so that to me is one of the most important um, aspects of any bid because if you don't answer what you're going to be evaluated on um, you will you will be disqualified I, you know, I've spoken to various procurement um, people in that, that evaluate bids, and there are people that sit with a checklist. So the customer's requirements is all on one page. As an example, for us in South Africa, we need to have a BE certificates. We need to be registered on a, a portal, procurement portal for all government entities. So um, if you don't include those, they will just disqualify you. They don't even look further at your documents. So um, the, ref, the RFP requirements, like a checklist, I will include that in the front of my bid so that they know exactly, so that the customer knows exactly which page or which section the um, requirements are that they are asking for. And then graphics. So any um, graphics that need to be used that you can think of, um, you can include them here and then you can put a description of the proposal, where in the proposal the graphic will fit in. I mean, you don't want to put in um, graphics that are not relevant to what our solution um, is going to be. And then here you could see if it's new or reused. Um, so, as I said, sometimes you need to bring in a graphic designer or somebody that can design a, a picture for you or a graphic for you. Um, then we get into the solution. So this is just high level. So um, it's for the solution architects to just jot down their ideas as they're having their um, solution meetings, they can write the idea so that they don't forget anything um, and all the key elements that that they want to um, bring into the proposal, they can make notes of. Then we get into the features and benefits. So what is um, the feature that we are proposing on our solution and what will the customer's benefit be by taking the solution? So. You know, I've sat in a lot of um, technical meetings and it's very high level technical talk, um, but that's not really what we want to get across to the customer. We want to dumb it down, if you want, for want of a better word, so that they can know um, what are they going to be getting out of this um, solution. Then we have differentiators. So we'll list um, all the differentiators as the technical team is working through the uh, technical meetings before they start writing, they'll list all their differentiators there. Um, we get uh, next one proof points. So what is um, are the proof points that our solution offers and what evidence or what proof are we going to give um, the customer. So it's great to say, you know, um, we can do X, Y, and Z for you, but where have we actually done it? And, you know, you need to tell the customer 
where you have, for instance, saved them money at another company, where you have uh, various skills. How many skills do you have? Um, what rating or what um, level of certification do they hold? All those types of things and then add a copy of the certification so if that's going to be your proof point as an example um john is a registered ccie for cisco then you would put his um certification there and sometimes you know as you're working on your proposal you forget to include all of those things so it's just a, like a placeholder of where you can put them same with value proposition. So anything that we're going to add uh, to the value to the customer will list there. And then assumptions. So also sitting in technical um, meetings, I mean, technical people don't take minutes of meetings. Um, so it's just easier to give them this plan. And as they are going working through the technical um, scope of work, they can list all the assumptions um, that they would include at the end. Then we have our company information. So depending on what the requirement is in the RFP, we could put any customer references, but you just need to make sure that what you list here um, under company references is what the customer requires. Um, some of them in, want to know what it was the um, value of the contract, what was the size, what was um, exactly what did we um, provide the customer with, um, is there customer contact details. Um, so yes, we will put everything there according to the RFP requirement. Um, what are our strengths as a company? What is going to make us um, stand out to the customer? What is going to make the customer remember us when they're reading 20 other proposal submissions? So what is our strength? We will put there. And you can also use um, the better comparison matrix um, that you, if you design um, and do those uh, types of things within your proposal process. Um, what are our weaknesses and how are we going to overcome them? Remember, as what we are going to ghost our competitors, our competitors are going to ghost us. So we would need to bring forward to our customer, we understand that we have this weakness, but we also need to tell them how we are going to overcome this weakness. So that when our competitors do ghost us, we already have that, the customer is already aware that we know of our shortcomings. So like cancels the other one out. And then you would also put um, your, uh, your potential um, competitors and their uh, weaknesses and their strengths. And then we will build on our, from their weaknesses and strengths, we can include them in our strengths. Um, obviously not our weaknesses, but definitely our strengths and show that we are stronger than the um, competitor. Then we also have the price to win strategy. So um, I've just listed a few questions here that will that you can think about when you are developing your price to win strategy. So um, as an example, positioning of the competitor and what deals have shaped the market previously. So it's nice to know what the customer has actually bought previously, what the environment looks like, what are the, are they interested in buying? Well, this and you know this can determine going forward in uh, developing a roadmap for your customer, as an example. Um, so maybe they're looking for ABC, but in two months or three months or two years time, they will be looking for other solutions that could bring more money. Um, customer needs and their buying analysis. So what? does the customer need and what do they want and what are they actually going to spend money on? Um, it's also important to know if pricing will influence the outcome of your bid. So if you are the lowest bid, will you win? Um, not always. I think um, value and benefit to the customer um, is very important. Uh, but for us in South Africa, sometimes the government um, tenders it's definitely about price. The lowest price will win. And then um, your tactical competitive 
um, intelligence. So how does the competitor solution differ from our solution? Have they maybe partnered with somebody else if their solution is not up to speed, if they've got weaknesses? Um, have they partnered with anybody else? Do we need to partner with anybody else? So yes, um, you know, there's lots of things to think about when you are doing your price to win strategy. Um, and then also what are any risks um, with regards to the pricing and how are we going to mitigate that? You know, do we include uh, contingency pricing for contingency in our um, overall price? Do we build in a factor for risk? Um, all those things need to be taken into account when you are pricing your proposal. And then um, just a little thing here, after I've done my plan and my roles and responsibilities, um, I prefer to do them as a separate document, depending on the size of the bid, because some bids have um, requirements that can be a few pages on their own. And I also find that people don't want to wade through a whole lot of stuff. So um, the roles and resp responsibilities are sometimes keep separate, like I say, dependent um, on the size of the bid. So let's go into bid writing. So, I mean, I'm no author, really. I've, I, I wrote this presentation and that's about, you know, I don't do much bid writing myself, but I like to guide people on how to write. Um, and to, I think the, th the thing that stands out for me is to produce short, sharp sentences that concisely convey a story. I mean, if you think about a bid being a story, um, how, you know, with the customer, what are their pain points? How are we gonna help them? What's the journey that we're gonna take them on? Not only for the RFP or the requirement that they're bringing out now, but going forward in um, and building the roadmap for them. And then, you know, if you're just um, inconsistent, and you have these long sentences, customers get distracted. And we don't want them to be distracted because as I said in the previous, uh, one of the previous slides, and I actually love the sentence, um, is making sure that you are the choice and not just a choice. So they will then see how good your competitor is, how much better they are, um, and yeah, probably go with them if we, you know, writing a lot of gibberish there. Um, the same thing, remember, if your response um, has a page limit or how many words or pages that you're allowed to use, we don't want to bog them down with a whole lot of um, stuff that they don't need to read and then only answer the question in the last hundred words, because then we're either going to overrun or we are not going to answer questions properly. Um, the same thing, the bid is about the customer. So we don't want to talk about us in the first 400 words. We want to get straight to what the customer's pain points are and how we are going to help them. <coughs> so, so another thing, um, what you could do is formulate a bid writing style guide. You can incorporate that into your bid plan. So, um, you know, various people answer various sections of bids, and we don't want um, it to come across as that to our customer that various people have written it. We want to speak from one voice. So therefore, um, you know, a bid writing star guide can help you. Um, it can help with um, what to think about, um, you know, when we are, are responding to a bid that has various restrictions. You have to use a certain font. You have to use a certain font style. Um, how are we going to address bullets? I know bullets, some people put full stops after a bullet, some people don't. So if you give the writers a guide on exactly how um, the response should be uh, written up front, it will also save you a lot of time at the end um, you know, that you, when you proofread so that you don't have to go and check all these little things in detail. You could do a spot check. That's what I sometimes do. Um, and then best practice uh, when it comes to bird writing suggests that we uh, use active voice rather than passive voice. 
Um, this is very helpful if you have a um, limit on the amount of um, words or characters that you are, are um, restricted to. So as an example, um, you would say KPI results will be sent out each month by the contract manager. So we'd rather than just say the contract manager will send the KPI results each month. It sounds better, it builds confidence, it's conveying to the customer that the contract manager actually knows what he needs to do. The same with the inspection of the facility was made by the OHS representative. You could just say the OHS representative inspected the facility. So even though it conveys the same message, it's just a simpler style of writing. Um, so they have just at the bottom, the little picture just shows you, I'm, I'm not going to go, I'm not an English teacher, but I mean, it's just talking about um, subjects, actions and objects. So in the active um, voice, when you're writing, you would say um, the subject is then followed by the action, what the person does um, and how they do it or where they do it or what do they use, which is the object. So in summary, um, failing to plan is planning to fail. I think um, every bid depend, not, not dependent on size, not dependent on um, time, not dependent on any other factors. Every bid needs to be planned properly um, and the planning needs to start early. Um, I know sometimes we don't have um, all the inside information but, um, you know, it, we still need to build that plan, no matter what the time or effort it will take. Um, and then again, thank you very much um, for the opportunity. Um, I'm more than welcome to, or willing to send this um, plan that I've developed to anybody uh, who, who would like it. It's in Word and my annotated outline is in Excel. My email address is on screen. You can more than welcome just to send me an email and I'll pop it through to you. It's just my own looking at various templates, designing what's going to work for me. And like I said, I'll send it to you in Word. You can develop it and plan it out to the way that that, that is going to work for you. So thank you very much for the opportunity to, you know, to have presented this. And um, I hope that you've picked up some good little tips and tricks. And like I said, please answer, uh, ask any questions that you have. Um, I'm here to answer. Um, and, and, and if there's any other tips, please um, just let me know in the chat and then I'll pick them up and add them to my plan. Thank you, Nicole. That was brilliant. I think uh, considering this is your first presentation and also uh, <laughs> We took a new role recently, which is just not even a month. Plus, you don't have electricity and your laptop is, as you speak, the battery might be going with that anxiety. I think, um, I think please, uh, if you are still here with us, please do say, uh, yes. uh, if you find it valuable, please do say thank you. It will inspire Nicole. But in the meantime, Nicole, thank you. Thank you so much for just sharing. There are a lot of questions. So let me, okay. let me start from the top. Um, so... <clears throat> First question, Nicole. I mean, yes. like, uh, um, Victoria asks is, uh, should you include subject matter experts in the planning process, which I think you, you have when I looked into the template, but should that be on the proposal specialist manager writing the doc? My spin, uh, what she's trying to say here is, should you include the subject matter experts in the planning process, or should that be just the proposal specialist manager writing the bid themselves? No, so I mean, the plan I use that plan, even if one person is writing the proposal, or if many people are writing the proposal. So um, I first go through depending on the size or the complexity of the bid, I'll remove things that are not that we're not really going to re um, be required um, to answer right now. So as an example, if it's a shorter uh, time frame, and we're not really going to, as an example, concentrate on wind themes, um, then I'll remove that from my bid plan and send, it, you know, when we have our kickoff meeting, I will go through the bid plan and fill it in um, on the parts where it's solution specific, 
um, I will let the solution architects fill that in when it comes to the pricing and the risks of the pricing. It's a collaborative, so I will take those notes. I will um, fill those things in. So, yes, it's a collaborative. I mean, a bid, a bid response to me is a team effort. You have a bid team, uh, even if it's two people. Uh, I don't do bids by myself, write them all. So there's always um, inputs from other people that's needed. Thank you, Nicole. Again, Nicole, I think follow-up question is, um, when do you create this bid planning document? Do you create after you receive from the tender document uh, before the kickoff? Uh, you know, do you have any um, perfect time when you can do that? Sure, so it's that definitely done before the bid is being written. Um, if you have a uh, customer analysis, if you know what your customer, you know, inside information, if you've helped um, the customer Crafting, you know what they, if you know your customer well, you know what their pain points will be, what they will be looking at more or less. And, and you know, even if it's not 100%, you can start planning very early. Um, you can write what you think your win themes will be. Um, you know that in three months time, a customer might bring out a, um, they're having issues on their network and they might bring out a networking tender. So you can start thinking about which um, solution are you going to provide? I mean, for us, um, where I am, we have multiple vendors that can provide a networking solution. So you'd need to think about which vendor would you use? What is the better benefit or the best benefit that you will get out from using that vendor? Be it they give you a better discount percentage. So you know, you could go in with the, uh, a better price to the customer. So those types of planning things you can think about, but it's very important that salespeople know their customers and you work very closely with um, sales. So as Pascal mentioned, I've just started a new role. I've been in my role a week and a half. <laughs> and um, I'm now also looking more at the sales operations and the bit management side, because I find in a lot of companies, um the, the two don't go hand in hand but if you can't work with if the bid people don't work with the salespeople to plan these things early uh and you only get given a bid you know when it's released and you knew nothing about it time and effort is really an issue and and i think that is why most of the times um bid managers sit and work throughout the night or three days, you know, they, they're working late and they, because they haven't been involved early on. So for me, planning, even if it's three months in advance of when the tender is going to be released, start planning. Thank you, Nicole. Nicole, uh, what if you make the plan? What if you sit down, but then the key stakeholders don't agree with your plan? Look, so the plan is flexible. Um, you know, every plan should be flexible. Uh, there are certain things that need to be in a plan. Um, you know, you could, what, what I've done previously, I've said, well, okay, you can, we don't have to plan. Um, and you can put anything you want to in there, but just note that these are the risks. One, you will be, you could be disqualified. Two, you're going to waste um, resource time, resource money, or you know, um, you're going to be, there's going to be a lot of wasteful expenditure on a bit. So I leave it up to those stakeholders, especially the higher up ones, <laughs> the executives. Um, if they come and say no, this is junk. Well, okay, if that's the way that they want to deal with it, but I do highlight those risks so that they know we could stand a very good chance of being disqualified without being um, without proper planning. Uh, that's, uh, I think that's a question from Ankit and Mandy, hope that helps. Um, so again, when the timeline is very short, you're talking about 10 days submission or something, Nicole, how realistic is it to come up with a big plan like this? No, so that, that's what I'm saying. You could scale your plan. So in, in a bid where you have, ex, as an example, only five days to submit, you need to discuss with the stakeholders or with your bid team what are the main things that you're going to focus on and, and plan on? And that could be, as an example, you're going to plan win themes and your dis and value proposition, because everything is about the customer. So, um, you know, all bids, all bid, um, and the writing should be about the customer. So, you know, you need to think about them strategically. What are the main areas that you would um, 
going that you would focus on um being it what whichever the bid team decides being it the win themes discriminators benefits adverse features um so yes it, it is it is totally scalable the plan that i have and each plan should be like that mm -hmm. so uh, this is a very interesting question from rita uh, what do you think is do you have an approximate percentage that uh, of, of your tender time scale that you can actually, okay, I'm going to spend five days or five percentage of the time for the tender time scale on planning. Is there anything that you recommend? What's the ratio of time spent preparing the plan versus preparing the bid submission? You know, uh, for me, it's dependent on how close you work with your sales people. So, um, if the plan, you know, if the salesperson comes to you and says, look, the tender is going to be released in two months um, for, but, I, you know, I already start planning, but it, it obviously the time of the plan or how to plan the time that it will take um, is much longer than when you just land, you know, a bid gets landed on your table um, and into you in five days. So, um, it's also, as I said, it, it's dependent on the complexity. I would think you would plan probably about 10% of the time, um, but a lot of the work can be done up front um, before, you know, if you are that close to your salespeople and if your salespeople are, are aware and they know their customers very well, um, they would know um, which bids are going to come out soon. The other thing to think about is, I mean, you know, do you want to do every bid that comes across your table? So therefore your uh, go, no go, or your bid, no bid, whichever way you call it, um, is vitally important. I, I don't do a bid plan before I've done my uh, bid, no bid, or my go, no go meeting, um, because I don't want to waste time. So once um, everybody is in agreement that the bid is a go, um, I normally spend the first day or two um, drafting my plan, um, getting various people's inputs, and then holding my kickoff meeting. Perfect. Okay. Um, and again, when, when we are planning, obviously we are documenting the wind themes, value propositions, and related information. So. Um, do we capture only high level details about the solution in the bid plan or do we firm that up, confirm that so that we can lift and drop directly into the submission to the client in the tender document we go? Okay, no, it's only high level. Um, you know, if the um, technical people are going to start writing their detailed plan, they, um, we're going to be spending five, six hundred pages sometimes, depending on this complexity uh, your bid plan could be. So it's very high level. Um, the details get written out when they're actually writing their plan, uh, when they're actually writing the proposal, sorry. Um, so the plan is just there to guide them. So remember uh, when they're writing about the solution, um, remember to include that benefit or remember to include um, that feature that we're going to have and highlight this um, uh, strength of ours to the customers. It's just a basic outline of, you know, a plan of how they're going to, and things to include, uh, like a reminder of what to include. So it's very high level. That's good. That, that's a good um, I mean, like, so again, there is a lot of beautiful messages for you, Nicole. Um, you know, Thank you. <laughs> great way to integrate your phone. And, uh, there's a lot of lovely messages. I'll just leave you to... Uh, uh, to, to share the blessings that the team has given. But uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I get love to, uh, to, um, to Nicole on her very first presentation. Uh, so, uh, Nicole, I think, uh, do you actually reuse your big plan um, or, uh, you know, like th this is a template that you said that you mentioned just now? Yes. But do you, it's okay, you created a big plan for one. Uh, do you do you start from scratch every time, or do you use the previous one and you go? No, I'm so copy and paste. I'm not totally averse to or reusing information. Um, I'm not totally, you know, against that. The only thing that I can say is um, that I start from scratch, and the reason being. Um, 
every requirement is different. So as an example, if I live in the in the um, plan that um, under evaluation criteria, if I say I only need to have three references, um, which was previously asked for, and now I get a bid where it says I need to have five customer references and I forget to change that or forget to take it out, I would automatically be disqualified. So um, things that can be reused, um, wind themes, um, features, discrim discriminators, those types of things, yes, you can reuse them, but I'd prefer to copy and paste them from a different one um, than just leaving it in there and deleting. I, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, you know, what uh, I, I personally don't like to, to copy and paste or to leave information there and just change. I start from scratch all the time. I know it's, it sometimes uh, gives me more work, but it just makes sure that I have everything that is pertinent to this requirement and not uh, leaving something in that that's been previous, that is asked in a previous submission. Totally, Nicole. I think the, that makes sense. Uh, but again, uh, you know, with the, with the way, as, as we say, the bids never stop. So by the time uh, you might be wondering, um, you know, what by the time I sit and plan the document, I just maybe get on with it and start to do the document, you know, straight away. Yes. That is a pros and cons of both the approaches. So have you have you had that sort of experience, Nicole, where, where you know, what ideally you should have done a big planning document, but you haven't, uh, yes. but you just went on straight and then you had some lessons learned out of it. Uh, you know, or sometimes you planned it well, but still it didn't work. Do you have any kinds of uh, um, stories or lessons from? Yes, I definitely do. So before I did the bid planning, um, you know, I, I had to work weekends, working late, um, working lots and lots of overtime, uh, working throughout the night, the date before or the day before submission, um, work, the tender was due. Um, so it, it was just a nightmare. Everything was not, uh, you know, collated properly. You don't have time to do your final formatting, your proofreading, your checking. So, you know, in my bid uh, plan on who's doing what, I, I do have a, um, well, my responsibilities matrix, I do have a due date um, block there. So then I know that that is, and people, that's why I've said the buy-in is very important because without people's buy-in, um, you don't know what other workloads, are. I mean, we all have other workloads, but so, you know, if I say to somebody by when, you know, this is the time that I need it, are you in agreement with that? Um, they could say yes, and then I can hold them accountable to that. Or if they are, if they can't give it to me on that day, we can agree mutually uh you know when i will be able to get the info the inputs but still in time um so um you know to be able to do the um proposal production the printing and the scanning and all of those things perfect thank you nicole again again you know what uh, attending a webinar is one but taking just that one action, you know, I'm sure you're going to get the slides out of it. And if you email Nicole, you're going to get the template out of it. But what I would love to hear is what is that one action that you're going to experiment between now and next webinar, which is Thursday next week, um, 6th of July, um, and then share that you tried it or you at least started this. That will be great. Um, if you can do that, that, that's what will make presenters like Nicole happy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so they taking the time to share what worked for them. Um, if you go and experiment it yourself and say, hey, I tried this, uh, this is working, this is not working, and uh, maybe help me or something she would love to help. So that's just any final questions before we before we, uh, before we we wrap up Nicole's session and start the Scribble quiz, please do add it in the chat. But if you, if, if you have picked up any valuable lessons or tips and one action, please do share it on the chat. But Nicole, in the meantime, please do browse through you have lots of love and messages from the team. Thank you again for Thank doing you. In a minute. I will start the scribble quest, but if you, if because writing again, documenting in this chat, I've learned this one thing, or I'm going to do that one thing means that you are reaffirming that you're, you're learning. So I strongly suggest um, you do that <laughs> and you go ahead and then you can do it. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole, for sharing. So let people come back with their, with their inputs in the meantime. Let's check how focused you are. We are some uh, uh, well-focused people in the webinar who always join every time. So now is the time. As you know, 
three questions from the webinar. Sometimes I go four or five, depending on the time. Today we have a lot more time, so let's have five. So uh, five questions from the webinar. It could be technical or it could be something basic. Um, so five questions from the webinar. Whoever answers still gets a point. Whoever answers first correctly also gets special points. So obviously, as you know, at the end, we'll unlock one of our learning sources. You know, Nicole, I used to participate and used to win a lot herself. <laughs> But now she's on the presenting zone. So next time I would like you to progress from attending into presenting as well, like Nicole. So let's start the scribble quest. Question number one. In the white plant slide, there were four icons at the bottom of the slide. What were the four icons? Oh my God. <laughs> That's so cool, Grace. Good, amazing. And I'm glad that the, that the British won the first question themselves. Perfect. Good. Next question. In the win to plant section, there were two uh, characters. Uh, one was saying, oh, maybe we should have planned it before we started. But there were two. One was the boss, the other one was the employee. Did the boss wear the construction hat or the employee was wearing construction hat? There was only one who was wearing. Who was it? <laughs> Mandy's construction, uh, literally Mandy's construction hat kicked in there. Yes, it's the boss. Um, in the how to plant section, um, at the bottom of that how to plant section, there was a diagram with the, with the number of steps. How many number of steps was there? How many steps were there? <laughs> That's a good one, actually, Krishna. You got the spelling right. Uh, no, Mike, it's four. So it's four, but good try, good try, good try. Uh, then, um, as a close, close, close call, that, you know, good, good that you tried. I, I give points to every person who tries. So please do, please do come in and try, uh, because trying is the first step. Mm. So in the big planning template, obviously the big planning template was very comprehensive, as you can imagine. It's pretty much like a solution template rather than a big planning template, uh, which was which is very, very, very useful for me. So there were a few sections within the big planning template. Section two was about big solution. And section four was about competitor intelligence. What was section three and section five? Hey, keep going. <laughs> I haven't got the answers yet. Grace, you got section three, company information, but section five, who is going to pick up section five? Ankit, you are close. Commercials, <laughs> yes. Grace, you, what, what's happened to you? What did you drink just before this? It seems to be very active, Grace. You are, you are an outright winner now, man of the series. Um, yes, it's uh, the third section was company information. The th second section was bid solution. Third section was company information. Then we had competitor intelligence and then we had commercials. Can anybody guess what was the last section? Not guess, actually say. Thank you, Demi. Thanks for joining. Have a good meeting. What was the last section? Computer intelligence is fourth. The last section, end of the day, somebody needs to do all these things. So what was the section? I think I gave away the answer. <laughs> yes, it's roles and responsibilities and sign off. The reason I picked up this question is, you know, mentally, even if you're not using the template, at least if you know the sections, you can very quickly go through that. Okay, what is it? I need to know the big solution. I need to know some basic company information. Yeah, I need to know who is the competitor. I need to know the pricing or the commercials of it. And I need to know who's going to do what and how the sign off is going to work, right? So that's about a good, good, good try, Lydia, that was close. Um, so what happens here? Again, uh, 
um, Nicole said a beautiful line, which she said is my favorite line. Can anybody remember what that favorite line was? Thank you, Wendy. Thanks for joining. What was the favorite line of, of um, yeah, good one, Lydia. Make, make sure you are the choice and not a choice. Yeah, so uh, that was the answer. So again, Lydia, good try. It's a, uh, again, Nicole, do, would you like to say that in your own words? Sorry, the, what my favorite line is. Uh -huh. Oh, it's to be the choice and not a choice. Correct. So that's the, that's the thing. Again, that's something which, uh, which resonated with me today. Um, so that's the end of Scribble Quest. And if you have any final question, please do ask um, Nicole now. But otherwise, thanks for joining. Thanks for supporting Nicole, because I know it's not easy to stand up in front that to one week uh, in your new job uh, with, with no power at home. Um, just feeling on the good way. Thank you for saying it means a lot to me. I'll, I'll keep a note of who are the people who stayed with it. It could also mean that I know this already. I know this already. But you know what? When somebody digests uh, 20 years of experience, say that in their own words, you know, there is always that one thing we can learn from them. I genuinely think pick up that one thing, go and experiment within your organization. Come and tell me next week, hey, I tied that. I went and asked whether there is a big planning template. I went and approached Nicole. Uh, I emailed her, got the template. I did this, did that. That's what learning is all about because you know it's important for you to not just join, but also learn and apply. So thanks for again joining the webinar. For, thank you for all the love and support. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, next week, uh, we have, uh, <clears throat> we have uh, um, Pepper Birch back. Uh, I would like you to give a lot more support because Pippa was supposed to present last week, but Pippa was down with COVID and she's coming out of COVID to present to us here. So again, a topic could be very similar. Uh, hold your horses, don't ride too soon. But that's again, uh, 25 years of experience from highways in the UK sector. That could be again, something that we could learn from there. Next week, 7th of July, 3 p.m. UK, you plan your calendar accordingly. And this recording will be available on demand with the same link and use the slides and later resources will be emailed out to you in the next 24 hours. And you can also catch up with the other webinars in the YouTube channel. That's it for me. Thank you again for all the love and support. Please do share if you enjoy that to Nicole. And also when we post the quiz winners and stuff, say, hey, hooray, thank you. And that's about it. See you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity, Pascal. Always a pleasure, Nicole. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good